Hi there. This is David Weiss, your board game concierge here at 401 Games. And this week's smorgasbord is Harry Potter House Cup Competition, published by the OP, which if you didn't know, is the rebranded name of USAopoly, which are who are the folks behind all those opolies, monopolies, and such. It was designed by Nate Heiss and Kami Mandel. Mandel was one of the designers of the excellent Harry Potter Hogwarts battle deck building game, and Heiss worked on the cooperative deck builder, the Red Dragon, in Battle for Greyport. So naturally, when they got together, they decided to make a worker placement game. Hmm. Now, before I get into the game itself, I feel like I need to say that if J.K. Rowling's recent very public pronouncements have soured you on the whole Harry Potter thing, then I totally support that. Uh, my personal opinion is that sex and gender are two very different things and that trans people get to be seen as the gender of their choice. Um, now, I'm very much in favor of voting with your pocketbook, as they say, uh, when it comes to these things. So, if buying any Harry Potter merchandise, official merchandise, is a non-starter for you, I totally get it and I see you. My job here today, though, is to talk about this game as a game, which I hope you will understand. So, with all that being said, Let's look in the box and see if Harry Potter House Cup Competition is the game for you. In Harry Potter House Cup Competition, you and up to three others will take the role of, I guess, house masters? Vying for the House Cup over seven rounds, which I think are supposed to represent the seven years of schooling one gets at Hogwarts. Whoever gets the most points wins. And you get points by fulfilling challenges, um, leveling up your students, and accumulating magic and knowledge. As I said in the intro, this is a worker placement game. So each round, students will take turns placing students on two spots on the board um, for their actions. The number of actions scales with the number of players, so some actions are only available for four players and some are only available for three or four players. And one action is available multiple numbers of times, um, but all the other actions are only available to one student per round. There are also location cards, um, which of which the first one starts the game face up and the others are revealed after years two, four, and six with more powerful actions, which helps a lot with replayability. Now, before or after you take an action, you can play a lesson card from hand to give you a bonus. Um, sometimes it's resources, sometimes it's just points, uh, sometimes it actually levels you up. So in this case, if you uh, concoct this brew, then you will get two knowledge and you will level up that student, the one that you have placed or are about to place, one level. Uh, and I'll talk about the leveling uh, mechanic right now. So. Each student starts the game at level one in each, of, in each of three subjects. So there's potions, there's charms, and there's defense against the dark arts. And I'm just gonna show the, these 3D sliders that they use here. So, um, you need lesson, you need to be at a particular lesson level to uh, 
play the lesson card appropriately. So for instance, to play this lesson card, your student has to be at least level two in Defense Against the Dark Arts. And for challenges, your student needs to be at the particular level, student or students, which I'll explain in a second, will need to collectively be at level four in Defense Against the Dark Arts, in this case, to get the reward at the bottom. So you need to be able to plan ahead. You don't necessarily have to or will want to um, specialize. Uh, it's kind of intuitive that you would want each student to specialize in a different skill. Um, it's actually helpful for reasons that I'll talk about to have a student who's kind of all around okay in all three subjects. Uh, but not only does having a high level in a subject give you access to the most powerful lessons and challenges, each level tracker that is at seven at the end of the game gives you 10 points, which is theoretically 90 points uh, at the end of the game. You'll never get them all to level seven, but still. Um, now, if you are ever missing magic levels, you can use magic tokens to compensate for those missing levels that you need for a lesson or a challenge, which is why taking actions that give you magic and getting rewards for magic is a good thing. After all the students have been placed, they all come back to their common rooms. That's what these, uh, that's what these things are. They're the common rooms. And then comes the challenge phase, where each player, in player order, um, will get to fulfill challenges if they want from their hand. So you can either fulfill two easy challenges or one easy and one hard challenge from your hand. For challenges, unlike lessons, you can, and a lot of the time must, combine together. Um, you can have students work together to complete the challenge. So for instance, for, for the Defending the Seven Potters challenge, which is worth 60 points, you need to have students with a combination of seven in Charms and seven in Defense Against the Dark Arts and pay two knowledge, and then you will complete that challenge and get the 60 points. Um, I mean, in this case, for sure you have to work together because there's no way to, for one student to get level eight in something. So this one, you must work together. It is great if you can have one student all by themselves doing something, let's say travel by port key, because then the other two can work together and do the other challenge, because you can only ever do a maximum of two challenges per turn. At the end of the round, after everyone has done their challenges, you move the round tracker forward. If there is a new location revealed, you turn it over and, um, if it's a three or four player game, whoever has taken this action, if someone has taken it, um, will get the owl token to be the start player on the following round. If it's a two player game, first player token switches automatically. At the end of the seventh round, you add up points for the gems that you will have accumulated in this very fancy uh, house cup test tube display. Um, then also 10 points for each level tracker, which has made it to level seven and 10 points for each pair of magic and, uh, knowledge token that you have left over at the end of the game. So is Harry Potter house cup competition for you? Well, if you like worker placement games and Harry Potter and can get past supporting J.K. Rowling, then yes, I think you will like this game. Uh, thematically, things are a bit wonky. I mean, wasn't there a House Cup competition every year, not just at the end of seven years? But, and why do all the students start at the same level? Uh, it would have been more thematic to give each student a unique power or a boost uh, to differentiate them. Uh, which brings me to the student tokens themselves. Uh, they're awfully hard to tell apart by color, uh, and the game assumes you know who is who. Uh, the names aren't on the back or anything. So that's fine for Gryffindor, uh, but honestly, who remembers which was Crab and which was Goyle? Uh, 
I think that's great that they blinged up the actual house cup stand with the test tubes and everything and the gems. Um, but why not proper color coded, coded minis for the students instead of spending their production budget on level trackers, which are cute, but often slide around or topple over anyway. Uh, furthermore, the graphic design choices are a little uh, unfortunate, I think. The font choices on the board get points for readability, but they're pretty generic, and the board overall is kind of dark and drab, which may have been the point uh, atmospherically, but it's not really spooky, it's just drab. Um, the iconography that they've chosen is also a little confusing, particularly the choice of a Hogwarts medal for easy challenges, because I see an H and I think hard, uh, but uh, you can't always tell the difference between the plain open scrolls, which are the easy lessons, and the open and closed scrolls for any lesson. So, uh, production design choices aside, it's a decent enough worker placement game with some good twists. Uh, there's good opportunities for planning and uh, some tough decision making right from the beginning. Uh, the rules are well done, but the fact that they spent the last two pages hawking their wares, the other games and things in the Harry Potter franchise, instead of, say, putting a, a decent summary or iconography thing on the back page, is a missed opportunity. Overall, Harry Potter House Cup competition is fine. Uh, but nowhere near as good, in my opinion, as Hogwarts Battles, if you're looking for the Harry Potter game, in my opinion. So, if you're still interested, click on the link below to order your copy of Harry Potter House Cup Competition. This is David Weiss, your board game concierge here at 401 Games. Thanks for watching. See you next time. Ciao.